Hey there! Here I am at school, it's night, it's the weekend, and I'm making copies because I have lots of new preps and I have lots of important things to do. So I thought while I'm making copies and while I'm uh, doing all this stuff that I have to do at school, which doesn't require my brains very much, it's mostly just pushing buttons on a machine, I thought I would um, go ahead and talk to you about Cymbeline since a lot of you wanted me to talk to you about Cymbeline. Shakespeare's Cymbeline. Summer reading test. Well, Cymbeline's one of those plays that isn't really talked about very much. Now, I don't know why that is, because I think it's pretty fantastic. Uh, it's really one of the, the best overlooked uh, Shakespeare plays out there, I think. I think part of the problem with it is that nobody knows quite what to do with it. It's a little bit different than a lot of his other plays. Um, in fact, I have a book of Shakespeare plays, Shakespeare tragedies, and inside is Cymbeline. I also have another book called uh, Shakespeare's Comedies, and inside is Cymbeline. Is it a tragedy? Well, uh, not exactly, because our characters do end up being okay in the end, and everything works out well. Um, it's also not a comedy, exactly, because after all, it doesn't, it doesn't expose human folly the same way that, um, that a normal comedy would. If you think, perhaps, Midsummer Night's Dream, or one of the, the better known comedies, they usually just expose human foolishness. Lord, what fools these mortals be. Um, but uh, Cymbeline doesn't do that so much. Our characters show a lot of strength throughout the play, even though um, we have a happy ending. There's also enough tragic elements, like the death of Clotten, which even though he's a complete jerk and we hated him, really is kind of horrifying. Imogen waking up to this dead body and thinking that it's her husband uh, is really, really intense. Also, all the things that Posthumus goes through, all the things that many of our characters go through, are, are too harsh to be considered uh, straight-up comedy. Hello, copy machine. Uh, it's not actually a comedy, it's not actually a tragedy, it's what we would call a romance. And a romance um, sort of falls in between the two. You might be able to categorize in some ways, like Romeo and Juliet some, has some elements of romance as well. If you notice that Romeo and Juliet ends Act 3 as a comedy, and then inverts and becomes a tragedy the second half. Cymbeline also contains a lot of characteristics of fairy tales. And we know that Shakespeare was interested in fairy tales. After all, Midsummer Night's Dream is definitely a book full of fairy tale and fairy tale characteristics. Well, Cymbeline has those fairy tale characteristics as well, and the same sort of story background uh, that we see in, like, the Grimm's Brothers. Uh, it starts off with an evil stepmother, pretty quickly, and we have a princess who is uh, lost and abandoned into the woods, um, who is saved from being murdered by a kindly person. Sounds a lot like Snow White. Not only that, but she also takes a, a gift from the queen, which causes her to die. Um, not literally, but appear to die. Um, and that sounds very much like Snow White. We also have uh, kindly wood people who help her, uh, who actually turn out to be her brothers in the end, uh, but her, her brothers who are lost children in the woods, that sounds a bit Hansel and Gretelish. There's so much uh, fairy tale to this story. Also in fairy tale, unlike in a tragedy, people get their just desserts, as it's called. They get what's coming to them. Clotten, who's violent and aggressive and stupid, he is killed for his anger. Also, the evil queen uh, dies of a cause that she brings upon herself. Her greed and her evil murderousness ultimately lead to her demise. So anyway, that was the summer reading test. Now I've got to go find our pre-assessment benchmark stuff and uh, make a class set copy of that for English 3. And uh, then I have to make my English 4 copies and then my English 3 advanced honor supplements, and etc. So, here we go again. As you remember, if you've ever taken my class, uh, Shakespeare's, uh, his five-act style, really illustrates the plot diagram. We usually start out exposition in Act 1, the rising action in Act 2, and by Act 3, somebody's made a really important decision, which has caused a turn, which ultimately leads to the end. And so the most important decision usually happens in Act 3. Act 4 is the descending action, but also the sort of hiccup, the extra problem to get over if we're in a comedy, or um, perhaps the second hope 
in a tragedy, in the point at which we think maybe things will work out anyway, even though they made that really bad decision back in Act 3. But then by Act 5, of course, everything falls apart. Now, want to talk about a denouement? There is a denouement in this play. Of course, we'll get to that when we get to um, Act 5. I have a 25-page pretest I have to print off and give to my class. You know what that's going to do to my copy count? <laughs> Apparently every time you get dizzy, all you do is get dizzy. Okay, so now I've printed that off and I'm going to go make photocopies. All right, back to Cymbeline. We start off with an introduction to Posthumus. Posthumus Leonatus. And that's a very Roman name. Incidentally, we are in Roman times. In fact, Caesar Augustus is in charge, which is important because um, this is the time of Caesar Augustus, which also happens to be the birth of Christianity. And it's quite possible. Hello, turn on some lights here. Quite possible that uh, Shakespeare has this in the back of his mind as he's doing this because this play would land right at the time of Christmas in fact, in its setting, and uh, there's a whole lot of rebirth kind of imagery at the end, and perhaps Shakespeare's doing this intentionally. Anyway, he didn't print. <laughs> All right, anyway, Posthumus uh, Leonatus is named after his father, who is named Leonatus. It means of his lion-like nature in battle. He's named Posthumus, which you might know what the word posthumous means. It means after someone's death, for instance, if a book is published posthumously, that means that it was published after the author died. Or a poem being published posthumously um, means after his death. In fact, posthumous Leonatus is, uh, was born after the death of his father, and so because of that he's named posthumous. In any case, his mother also dies, and so he's an orphan. And he's taken in by the king because he's a really good guy, and his dad was an excellent um, warrior for uh, the country, as were his brothers, who both also died in battle. In any case, Posthumus is uh, of excellent character. And we open the play with a description of Posthumus by two lords or two noblemen. And they are talking about how wonderful he is, how many good qualities he has. He's so good through and through. But the problem is, okay, here he was raised in the king's house. And during that time, he fell for the princess, whose name is Imogen. After falling for Imogen, the two of them got married secretly because he was perfect for her and she was perfect for him and uh, and everything was great. The only problem is dad was really mad. So um, the king does not like that uh, Imogen or Imogen um, has married Posthumus without his consent. Now the real problem here is the fact that the king's wife um, has died and uh, he's remarried, and he's remarried a very evil woman. The new queen is really there just for the power, and she's trying to, uh, to gain control of the throne. Uh, she's saying and doing things that are damaging to those all around it. The king does not realize how very, very much she is manipulating him, and we see it constantly. She's constantly stirring him up, and she's always saying, oh, he's completely in my hands, and I can do whatever I want with him. And so, uh, because of that, the queen does not like Imogen, because Imogen stands in the way of her own son, um, Imogen's stepbrother, uh, whose name is Clawton. And true to his name, he's awful. Leftover coffee from Friday. Still good? Of course it is! Imogen has more right to the throne by being the direct heir of uh, Cymbeline, the king, than Clotin does, because Clotin's married into the family, but he's not actually a son of Cymbeline. He's a stepson, and so he doesn't have direct line to the throne. However, uh, the queen's clever plan here is to marry Clotin to Imogen, and in pops Posthumus, and marries Imogen instead. And the queen does not like this. She's very angry about about it, and so she works the king up into an anger about it. Now, Posthumus is a noble young man, and although he's not very rich, he's pretty poor and penniless and an orphan, his family is, um, has done good things for the king, and uh, Posthumus is deserving in and of himself, according to everyone up to this point. The king's decision to hate Posthumus and exile Pos Posthumus, banish him, is really more a product of, um, of the queen manipulating the whole situation than it is the king, perhaps. 
Now, Posthumus is going to show himself noble in the book, but not right away. In fact, in two-thirds of the book, he's going to be pretty dreadful, and he's going to make some huge mistakes. Some of the same mistakes that his father-in-law, his unwilling father-in-law, um, Cymbeline, is making. We start off with um, Cymbeline bursting in on um, Posthumus and Imogen as they're saying a tearful farewell in the garden, and Cymbeline drives Posthumus out, saying, if I ever see you again, I'll kill you. So we see how much the queen is manipulating them. The queen told them they could meet together, but then, instead, um, she goes and gets the king and, and brings him in to, to disrupt the meeting, just to add more uh, anger against Imogen. Now, uh, the queen is trying to set Imogen and Clotten up. It's not happening because Imogen's already married and faithful, faithful, faithful to Posthumus. And even though the, the king has said the marriage is not legitimate, um, Imogen will never, never of course, marry Clotten under any circumstances, but certainly never marry anyone else um, because she's going to be true forever and ever to dear Posthumus. So Posthumus heads off to Italy, uh, leaves England behind. Now, Italy incidentally, is Rome, right? We're in the Roman Empire, Caesar Augustus, and there's some tension between Caesar Augustus and Cymbeline that we're going to see throughout this play, which becomes important towards the end. Posthumus heads down to Rome, and once he gets there, he's all sad because he misses Imogen, obviously. Now, in the garden, they traded um, favors. Posthumus gave her a special bracelet to wear to remember him by, and she gave him this very, very valuable uh, ring with a diamond on it, uh, so that he would always remember and think of her as he's far away. As they're separated, Posthumus is going on and on about it, and everyone loves Posthumus down in Italy and in France as he traveled through those lands, but there's one problem that Posthumus has. Every time people start talking women, he gets really loud, and he starts talking about how much better Imogen is than any other woman alive and how she's so gorgeous and she's so pure and she's so perfect and there's she's so great and he gets to the point that some of his friends get a little sick of hearing it. In particular there's a character he runs into in Italy called Giacomo and Giacomo is our villain so to speak one of them and he says I bet you anything that I could go um, get her to break faith with you and sleep with me instead. And so Posthumus says, yes, I'll bet you this ring that she gave me. If you are able to trick her into sleeping with you, then you can have the ring. Um, but if not, then not only will you give me all of your money and all of your wealth, but you'll also have to fight me and I'll, I'll fight you. So Yakimo takes the bet and heads north to Britain with some messages from Posthumus for Imogen. And there's one more important detail in Act 1, part of the exposition that we figure out, and that is that the king's sons, his two previous sons, uh, Imogen's brothers, were kidnapped or disappeared. They vanished. They've gone missing from the time that they were children. They were two and three at the time. And because of that, Cymbeline does not have an heir to the throne other than Imogen. Scene six of Act One is the scene in which Yakimo comes and tries to seduce Imogen. Um, and it's a horrible failure. He can't do it because she's so pure. How he goes about doing it is interesting. He comes up to her and he says, oh, hey, it's you. Wow, you're beautiful. I can't believe you're so gorgeous. Oh, oh, wow, swoon. And then he says, Man, if I had a girl like you, I sure wouldn't be doing what Posthumus is doing down in Italy. We all call him the Jolly Briton, and he has wild parties, and he laughs at people who talk about their girls because he says that girls just make you weak and he doesn't like women. Anyway, Imogen is confused by this report, and at first she's listening to it, but finally, uh, Yakimo comes to his point, and he says, you know, since he's such a, a rotten person to you, you ought to get your revenge. And the revenge, he means, is by sleeping with him uh, to get back at Posthumus for all of his bad behavior, according to Yakimo, down in Italy. And Imogen, when hearing this, realizes what a scumbag Yakimo is, and so she begins to shout for help. And instead of um, continuing to try to win her over, Yakima realizes she's not going to be broken this way, and so he pretends like it was all a game of his. And he says, oh, I was just testing you to see how faithful you really are to that wonderful guy, Posthumus, who I love so much. I was just testing you. 
All right, so Imogen buys that. And then Yakumo says, hey, do you mind keeping this special box in your room safe for me? Because um, I don't have a good place to keep it and I need it to be really safe. And so she does. Act two begins with Clotten and his lords. There are two lords that follow Clotten around and flatter him. One lord really flatters him. The other one makes fun of him behind his back. But Clotten uh, struts around and talks about how brave he is and how he would fight anybody and he'd love to beat anybody up and how he's going to win Imogen, and Imogen's just stupid for not loving him. She's trying to win her over by playing music at her door and things like that. Uh, meanwhile, Imogen is going to bed, and we see her in her bed chamber, and uh, as she's laying to sleep, we see the innocence around her and the sweetness of her as she's, she's uh, holding fast to the memory of Posthumus. And we have this contrast between her sweetness and what else is going on in the room. Because hidden inside the box that she took in on security to take care of for Yakimo is Yakimo himself. He's been hiding inside of it, and when she sleeps, he creeps out of the box and into her bedroom. And he looks around at the bedroom and writes down everything that he sees. He'll have lots of juicy details to tell Posthumus when he gets back. And um, he uh, looks carefully at Imogen for uh, a mole that he finds that, uh, that he's able to use as proof that he slept with her. And then he steals the bracelet that uh, Posthumus gave to her at the very end. And so this is her most precious and prized possession uh, that she would never let go of because it's her gift from Posthumus. And so uh, Yakimo, uh, manipulating the situation, makes it appear that Imogen has slept with him because he has all the details, he has her bracelet, it looks like she was untrue to Posthumus. And he's going to use this uh, to convince Posthumus down in Italy uh, that he's done this awful deed that they had bet on. Now it's interesting to see the contrast between the evil in Yakimo and um, and the innocence in uh, Imogen. We see a similar scene in Faust uh, between Gretchen and Faust, when Faust is sneaking around in Gretchen's room before he's really gotten to know her, as uh, Mephistopheles lets him into Gretchen's room. And uh, the contrast between evil and between innocence is, is pretty clear here, but also we see Yakimo's being sort of overcome by his passions and by the beauty and innocence of Imogen, but yet that's not enough to stop him from doing this awful thing to her. 